Hello, my name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant. Today, I'm going to be covering this book, I Wanna Go Back, Stories of the Philmont Rangers. I bought this at Coez Books. Uh, it is a revised and updated edition written by Warren Cole Smith. This is a book about Philmont Scout Ranch and the Rangers that made it the way it is today. This book was published in 2013. What I bought it for was $7.98. This book is kind of short. It's only about 220, 230 pages long, but it's interesting in a slower way. It is, for the most part, a history book a book of anecdotes and the history of the Philmont Trail Ranger program. The subject, by its very nature, is about Boy Scouts of America and their most prestigious high adventure camp. So on the one hand, it's interesting to me, I am an Eagle Scout, I went through the program from Tiger Scout all the way up through uh, Eagle Scout, if you're not particularly interested in that youth organization, this book may present a barrier of entry. Ultimately, it's a fun book. The anecdotes are really funny and really engaging. You can feel the sense of urgency and danger in some of them, but also the sense of loss after a flash flood, pride after doing a great task. It chronicles the birth of the Trail Ranger program all the way to where it stood when this book was published. And there are a lot of leadership changes, program developments, and overall a lot of things that the Trail Rangers have to be proud of and to look back on fondly. This book also comes with a few appendices. Where are Philmont's chief rangers now? The Ranger Song. And then an index, uh, it provides also a picture from 2007. Philmont's Chief Rangers in 2007, as many of them as can be there. The Chief Rangers in this case are the Rangers in charge of the entire Trail Ranger program. It is really interesting to see the changes in the program as it's evolved, partially to meet more environmentalist thought, partially to meet upgrades in equipment, changes to the program made to make the experience more about the scout and their challenges rather than the trail ranger's ability to guide and lead. As an example of one of those changes, early on in the trail ranger program, they carried a Dutch oven with them for the few days that they accompanied a unit, a, a scout troop. And on the third day, they would provide, uh, I think it was peach cobbler, cooked in that Dutch oven. Nowadays, carrying a 12, 14 pound Dutch oven would be seen as a bit excessive. Even then, it had to have been a lot of extra weight. They were really showing off their strength and experience as backpackers to be able to carry this. Nowadays, due to fire restrictions and just better understanding of weight management, we see that the trail rangers don't do that anymore. They will carry some kind of dessert that they present the, I think they said it's a pound cake now, and so they'll have pound cake, whipped cream on that last day, maybe some strawberries or cherries, and then they'll depart. Now there is that change made because, you know, a Dutch oven requires coals. And with the modern day drought in New Mexico that covers basically the entire state, it's not seen as environmentally friendly to have so many fires in a drought and fire controlled region. Without that ability to have those Dutch ovens and the fires to cook that cobbler, it's easier to transition to a pound cake, which already comes pre-cooked, and all you have to do is protect it from bears between the day you leave and the day you part with that trail ranger. And they also discuss trail rangers that 
did minimal breaks and just kept on going on trip after trip after trip. They wanted to be there for the mountains. Here's a good uh, section titled Rangers and Gear. The mention of all the equipment used on the tooth rescue is a reminder that rangers necessarily become gear geeks. The very fact that rangers have a front row seat to the parade of gear hauled to the ranch by thousands of backpackers each summer made them all minor experts. But rangers have a very specific need for showing gear and how to talk about it, and that is the ranger shakedown. The shakedown is a key moment in the life of a crew at Philmont. It's when the ranger gets the crew together and goes over everything in a camper's backpack, item by item. With 20 to 40 crews arriving at Philmont every day, shakedowns happen constantly. Often, you'll see a crew with its gear spread out in one of the few grassy areas around base camp. Sometimes, especially if it looks like rain, the ranger will ask crew members to pull their cots out of the tent and spread the gear on the foamy mattress. If the rain comes, it's easy to slide the cots quickly back into the tents. Shakedowns, like bus tours, are a part of a ranger's job that contains one part quality instruction and one part theater. Rangers quickly develop one-liners and anecdotes to make sure their crews remember to leave beloved but unnecessary equipment behind. Or, some old and all but obsolete piece of gear might be the best a camper has. According to Joe Lees, it's easy to overlook the economic realities of a family sacrificing to get their son on a trek, but those realities might surface in the quality or age of the equipment. And you might never know the sentimental ties a boy might have to a piece of equipment from an older brother or cousin who left it to him before he went into the army. Of course, many crews come well prepared, and others, like the one Luke Vermeer had in 1994, have something else up their sleeve. Vermeer began a shakedown with a crew that had big 4D cell battery mag lights, old G.I. Joe sleeping bags, two full-length axes, pillows, stacks of blue jeans, blow-up air mattresses, two burner propane stove, a Dutch oven, and several other things that might be useful on a weekend car camping trip, but would certainly not work on a Philmont trek. Joe Lease remembers the story. He waited until everyone had most of their gear out and approached the advisors thinking he would need to have a serious talk. When one of them asked what he thought and if they had enough gear, Luke commented that they had everything but the kitchen sink. At that point, one of the adults opened the top of his pack and removed the kitchen sink that had been in his motorhome until earlier that afternoon. Luke was stunned for a moment and then everyone had a good laugh. It was an elaborate joke on the ranger. The crew did just fine. And so there's stories like that where the ranger comes in thinking they're going to have this joke, this this uh, program, and the, the campers turn it on their heads, but everyone is a good sport about it. Everyone has fun with it. But there's another aspect of this book that I wanted to touch on because it's part of what my scouting experience was like that I think is highlighted really well in this book. On page 83, we have this section, Women Rangers. However, one major innovation that took place on George Smith's watch as Chief Ranger has ever since had a major impact on the Rangers and on Philmont, and that is hiring the first female Rangers. In 1969, the Boy Scouts of America formalized the decision for women to be in the Explorer program. Women were already working at Philmont, but they were typically on the permanent staff in administrative roles or in other non-program roles. Exceptions were Mammy and Pappy Scholl, the lone staff members at Crater Lake in 1953. By 1972, director of camping Joe Davis believed that Philmont might be ready for its first women rangers. The question was, who to hire? Hiring a Philmont staffer had by the early 70s become a tried and true process. Eagle Scout? Check. Council Camp Experience? Check. Experience at Philmont as a camper? Check. Order of the Arrow? Check. An applicant with all of these boxes checked would likely be a successful Philmont staffer. But these opportunities were not available to women. 
So what would indicate on a young lady's application the same easily quantified commitment to scouting, to Philmont, and to outdoor activities? One answer was simply to hire young women he knew. So in 1972, he hired Kathy Leach and Nancy Wells to be the first women rangers. They were younger sisters of Philmont staff Bill Leach and Rusty Wells. Davis joked that if the girls did not measure up, he could use their brothers to put pressure on them. Or, if any young men on staff might be tempted to behave in a manner unbecoming a scout and gentleman, he would have to face their big brothers. Whether Davis was serious or joking hardly mattered, since Kathy Leach and Nancy Wells both became excellent rangers, and were young women who could take care of themselves both in the woods and with a bunch of Boy Scouts. This page also comes with a picture of the two of them working, um, both in uniform, one holding a rock and the other doing some task that is off camera. I continue though. In fact, the experiment went so well that in 1973, Philmont hired 10 women, Lisa Buskirk, Jennifer Elsie, Kathy Leach, Chari Mann, Carol Munch, Jan Nelson, Margie Rockenfield, Betsy Roof, Susan Van Gorp, and Hannah Wilson. According to Carol Munch, many of us arrived at Philmont by way of having brothers who worked there or other connections. Munch continues her description of the early days of women rangers. In 1973, we were treated like any other rangers, took our crews, and participated in all programs. Our chief ranger was Dr. Smith. Six of us came back to a very different ranch for the summer of 1974. Joe Hawkins was the director of camping, and he wasn't sure of females in the back country. Because the Explorer Scouts were on Philmont the first two weeks and last two weeks of the summer, we took out co-ed crews at that time. During the middle of the summer, we were restricted to mountain women crews. We called it Camp Quarantine. During that time, we were not supposed to be seen in the back country. We had alternative camps set up to accommodate us for program. We camped at Hunting Lodge not a camp at that time, and the CETO staff sent a climber down when it was time for our program. We camped at Deer Lake Mesa, and Gary Richards, camp director of Harlan, and the future husband of Chari Mann, brought us burros for our Mexican dinner and burro racing. By 1975, female rangers were once again able to take out any crews. Lloyd Knutson became director of camping from 1976 to 1986. My sister Jane was on the first and only Kit Carson women crew in 1973. Kathy Leach and Margie Rockenfield were their rangers. In 1976, I took out the first Rayado crew. One of the participants on that crew was Joyce Schroeder, who grew up to be chief ranger. That's on page 85. They fulfill that promise on page 148 in a section titled, She's Chief Ranger. That was a lot to take in, but it's emblematic of my experience in Boy Scouts and why I'm so happy that Boy Scouts finally opened up full membership to young women, that young women can get Eagle Scout, can go through all the merit badges, go through every single program that their male peers can go through. When I was in Cub Scouts, the group I was with, the den I had, was six or seven boys, and of them, two of them didn't go on to Boy Scouts, and the other five, myself included, did. Of those five, four of us had little sisters. Of those four, three of them had little sisters that went on to found a venture crew in my hometown region. That venture crew wasn't just made up of those three younger sisters, but younger sisters of people from across the district, the scouting district, that they wanted to participate in the same kinds of activities their older brothers or younger brothers did. They were mildly disillusioned by the Girl Scouts, or some of them were still active in the Girl Scouts, but also with the Venture Crew. That Venture Crew was formed almost exclusively of sisters of Boy Scouts for five or six years. My sister was never involved with it, but like I said, I knew some of the girls that were involved in it, and they were fantastic scouts that really embodied the 
entire program. They should have been Eagle Scouts, and the fact that they weren't is only because they were too old by 10 years to participate in that program. It's a real bummer, but those were the experiences of women for the last century in Boy Scouts. A lot of young women wanted to participate in the same way their family members were, but they weren't able to. Like they say in this book, a lot of those first female rangers were siblings of Philmont rangers. And within only a few, I think it was 15, 12, 15 years, they have their first female chief ranger as representative. That is part of the legacy of Philmont. This book, I Want to Go Back, is about chief rangers and is for chief rangers, but it's also for Boy Scouts. It's for people interested in that portion of history. It's for people interested in backpacking history. It's for a lot of people. I think the audience that is going to enjoy this the most is going to be Boy Scouts, people involved with that program, people that have been to Philmont and can reminisce about it. This book serves as a walk down memory lane for people that worked there and for people that just participated there. I myself participated but never worked there. This book does a really good job of giving a detailed look at Philmont Scout Ranch's Trail Ranger program. I really loved this book and I think if you're at all interested in some of the books I've been talking about on this channel before, this book will interest you as well. My name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant.